My name is Mike Clegg, and I'm a, a professor here. Uh, I've been teaching for over 40 years, and uh, this is the fourth time that I've taught Bio 94, and I'm looking forward to spending the basically the first half of the quarter with you. My last lecture will be on February 15, but I'll be lecturing most of the lectures through February 4th, and then I'll miss a couple of days. The other instructor in the course is Professor Robin Bush, and she will teach the last half of the course. The topics that I'm going to cover are basic evolutionary biology, and then I'll give a couple of lectures on plants, a lecture on fungi, and that will cover the spectrum of material that I'll talk about. Okay. Let me, there's a, so I'm going to begin with some material which is actually posted on the website. Oh, heck. <laughs> okay, well, that's all right, I can do. Which is actually posted on the website, but just so that we all begin on the same page. Um, I've already introduced you to myself. The course coordinator is Dustin Fan, who's standing right here. We'll be using clickers for exams, and you're all familiar with these things. I'm sure you've used them in other courses, but we'll have a quiz every Friday, and they'll be clicker scored, so you're going to have to remember to bring your clickers to class. Uh, Catherine Gallagher is the um, clicker coordinator. Now one important thing for you to know is that UCI does not allow professors to do drops and ads of classes, so I can't do that. If you need to drop or to add this class, you're going to have to go to the Biological Sciences Student Affairs Office to do that. So don't come up to me and make that request because I can't respond, I can't be helpful. There's uh, uh, information will be posted on the uh, website for the course. In addition, there's a, a triple E message board that both Dr. Bush and I will look at daily. If you have any comments or questions, particularly if they're questions because they may be useful to the other students in the class, post them on the message board. We'll try to respond to them as quickly as possible. The textbook for the course is, is this book, which is called Biological Sciences. This is actually uh, an abstract from a larger book, also called Biological Sciences by Scott Freeman. This is the special UCI edition, which only includes the chapters that we're going to cover in this course, and it's a lot cheaper than the big book. But you can buy either the big book or this book. This is much less expensive, and it's um, available in the bookstore. It's the fourth edition, and the earlier edition was also used in this course a few years ago the third edition, there are significant differences between the two editions, so you really must have the fourth edition. I will be lecturing from the fourth edition, and I'll try and stay pretty closely to the material in the textbook in order to make it as easy on you as possible to get as high a grade as possible. Now, uh, Some other information, I've mentioned the clickers already, uh, the grading for the course, the midterm will count 40%, the final will count 40%, the final will not be comprehensive, it's going to be over the last half of the course, so the two exams count equally, the, uh, the range, the scoring range for various grades is given here, and all of this is also posted on the course website. So you get 19% of your grade for the quizzes. 1% for <laughs> you'll get simply for submitting the online instructor evaluation. So that comes to 20%. That makes up the difference. Um, we'll drop the lowest quiz score. 
So over the course of the quarter, 10 weeks or 10 quizzes, will take the nine highest scores you have for that 19%. That means that if you miss a quiz for any reason and get a zero, that zero can be dropped. But what we will not do is give makeup quizzes. We can't do it for a class of this size. So if there's one day when you're sick and you don't come to class and you miss a quiz, that will be wiped out, but you can only miss one. You'll have to be here for the remaining nine. Okay. Another detail is that you'll have one week to review any posted score on clickers or exams, and if you have a problem, get to us within the week and we'll try and see what we can do to resolve it. After the week, the thing is fixed in concrete. You have discussion sections with very competent teaching assistants who will help you work through the materials and will help answer questions that you have. The lecture slides are gonna be posted. They'll be posted at the latest by 6 a.m. on the morning of the class, probably the night before. And one thing you might want to do is to think about printing the slides and using those to take notes on, but they'll be available to you for, as a study guide. Now, let, let me now turn away from the issues of the course um, administration and begin to talk about the real subject matter of this course. And the first, and I'm going to cover the first chapter of your book in this lecture. Okay, and what, one of the questions to begin with is why is science important? Why has it had such a big impact on our understanding of the world? And the answer is that science reveals through experiment and careful observation non-obvious facts about the world. Our intuition leads us to conclusions which are often not right. And science has provided a methodology that allows us to probe more deeply into natural phenomena and to reveal non-obvious facts about the world. And I've just made a list here of some of the things that weren't obvious to people before. Uh, and have become apparent through the application of scientific method. One thing we'll talk about today is the fact that new cells do not arise by spontaneous generation. They only arise from pre-existing cells. But up until the famous experiments of Louis Pasteur in the, last, in the 19th century, it was believed that cells arose at least in part through spontaneous generation. Biological diversity is the result of a slow process of evolutionary change, a non-obvious fact about the world. The mechanism of inheritance is particulate, not blending, which, which is what people of the 19th century, including Charles Darwin, believed. And in fact, there's a, a wonderful mathematical proof by a man named Ronald Fisher, who was the great creator of modern statistics that shows that a blending system of inheritance is completely incompatible with evolution by natural selection. The universe does not rotate around the Earth. Copernicus, the Earth is not flat, as believed by our ancestors five or 600 years ago. The Earth is old. We know from physical measurements that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. The universe itself is about 13.7 billion years old. Very old in the context of a short human lifetime. Light has a dual nature, both particulate and wave-like, something that wasn't obvious until the late 19th century. And Dark matter constitutes more than 80% of the matter in the universe, something that's only become apparent in the last 20 or 25 years, a, a major fact about cosmology that we've only 
recently been un able to uncover using the tools of science. So science is hugely powerful to tell us things about the world that aren't obvious. Now, <clears throat> what is life? Well, life has several essential characteristics. One is metabolism, an energy system. You've got to have an energy system to provide for the growth and activity of cells. So fundamentally, metabolism or an energy system. There has to be replication and reproduction. And this implies the capacity for population growth. There has to be a system of information transfer. That is an inheritance system. Those, those three properties are fundamental to life. Now your textbook lists a couple more properties, one of which is the property to evolve. Life has to be able to evolve, to change, to adapt to changing physical and biotic circumstances in the world. So now let's, let's jump forward to the 1660s with the invention of the microscope, which was one of the great sort of technological leaps in the study of biology. This is an interesting era because we've gone in the last 50 years, just in my scientific lifetime, a huge expansion of technologies that allows us to understand and to see life at greater and greater levels of depth and resolution. But one of the first big steps in that direction was in the mid-1600s with the invention of the, light, uh, of the microscope. And Robert Hooke, who developed his own microscope, which was able to magnify objects to about a 30-fold power, was able to first see and describe the fact that living material was made up of cells. And he, his initial observations were actually on the bark of cork trees, where he could see that the bark was made up of a series of cellular-like structures. And it turned out that this cells are um, a universal organizing feature of all life, that cells which are uh, enclosed in a plasma membrane and therefore confine the metabolism of life in a small uh, area with a large amount of surface contains the, all of the metabolic processes. So, <clears throat> Hooke made this fundamental discovery that life is composed of these much smaller structures that could not be seen um, until the invention of the microscope. And he hypothesized that all life is composed of cells. And this postulated a pattern that these were the fundamental building blocks of all life. And there's a second then component that became a burning question, and that is, what do cells originate from? What is the process that governs the origin of cells? So there, there are two, quest, two questions. One is the pattern question. All life is made of cells. And then the question of where do cells come from? And the answer, uh, is, is given by the cell theory, which states that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning of my lecture, there was an alternative theory, which was that uh, cells, at least in some cases, might arise by spontaneous generation. And this appeared consistent with day-to-day -day observation. If you left meat out, it spoiled. Um, if you, you, people observed that wine and milk and other foodstuffs 
spoiled after they were left out for a certain period of time. And they spoiled because cellular-like microorganisms occupied them. So, the, so there, are, there are two hypotheses that emerged during the 19th century. The first we'll call the null hypothesis is that cells arise by spontaneous generation in nutrient-rich media. And then the alternate hypothesis that cells arise only from pre-existing cells. Right, now how do you test these hypotheses? One of the big steps in 19th century biology was developing an experimental framework that allowed for the testing of hypotheses about the biological world. So what's a hypothesis? It's simply a, in a, it's a proposed explanation. It makes a prediction that can be measured, that can be observed or measured. And if that's correct, we take the hypothesis to be provisionally valid. A properly designed experiment has to be capable of falsifying a hypothesis. And we'll see several examples of properly designed experiments in the next few minutes, all drawn from the first chapter of your book. What is a scientific theory? Well, scientific theory are made up of observations about a natural pattern and the proposed process that explains the pattern. So um, the pattern, again, is all life is made up of cells. The process is cells only arise from pre-existing cells. So here's the experiment. This is the experiment that was actually done by Louis Pasteur in the mid part of the 19th century. Pasteur was a fascinating man. He made huge contributions, uh, developed several of the original vaccines. He was actually, a, as a young kid, he was an indifferent student. He wasn't a great student. Nobody would have guessed that he would have become one of the great scientists of the 19th century. But one key experiment he did, which is outlined on this slide, was to show that the hypothesis of spontaneous generation was false. And how did he do that? Well, it had long been observed that if you take a nutrient-rich solution and simply let it sit exposed to air, it would develop contamination. And eventually you would see yeast growing on it, or you would see that it became, became turbid due to microbiological activity. So the way he conducted this experiment was to take two sets of flasks, and both of them were treated identically. They had the same nutrient-rich broth solution, and that solution in both cases was boiled to remove any pre-existing microbiological activity. And then they were allowed to cool and sit for a few days. And there was just one key difference between the design of the flasks, only a single factor. One, fact, one flask had its neck open to the air. The other flask had a curved neck. And during the boiling process, the vapors from the boiling of the flask would condense in the elbow of the neck and provide a block to the entry of exterior particles. Now, it turns out that dust and other particulate matter in the air contain bacteria and yeasts, which cling to them. In fact, we're breathing these in and out as we speak. And so the flask, which was exposed to the air, dust particles would settle in it, and this would start new bacterial and yeast cultures growing in that flask. But in the other flask, 
no contamination was observed because the condensate in the neck performed a barrier. Now the condensate is purely the distillate from this boiling. It has no nutrient solution, so it doesn't provide a substrate that bacteria or yeast can grow off of. So it provided a barrier to the entry of bacteria and yeast into the cells. And, and even after these flasks had been allowed to sit for a long period of time, no bacterial or yeast growth was observed in the set of, in the cells, in the flasks with the curved neck, proving that spontaneous generation did not occur. Because if spontaneous generation had occurred, you would have seen contamination in both designs. So it's a strong experiment, a single factor. Uh, it was convincing to the contemporaries of Pasteur and helped reject the notion that spontaneous generation could be explained for the appearance of bacterial and yeast cultures in food and in other materials. Okay, now, a word or two about the theory of evolution by natural selection. We're gonna come back in, in Wednesday's lecture and talk more about this. But just as a beginning, in 1858, again around the middle of the 19th century, two people <laughs> wrote an article that proposed the, the theory of evolution by natural selection. And one of them, of course, we all know, that's Charles Darwin, who was the famous 19th century naturalist who, who wrote extensively on a wide variety of evolutionary subjects. The other was a man who is less well known, but, he, but is equally credited with coming up with this theory. is a man named Alfred Russell Wallace. And I'll tell you more about their story on Wednesday's lecture, but for, for the moment, both Darwin and Wallace together proposed this theory, and it has a couple of key elements. The first that they posit that natural selection has occurred and that species have changed through time. Now, and that natural selection is the process that explains the pattern of biological diversity. Right, now, how does this process work? Well, well, we'll spend a lecture to going over examples of how it works. But it, it's based on a couple of very simple propositions. The, the first is that in any population, there are are heritable variations among the members. Now look at the people in this classroom. We all look a little different. We have different heights, different weights, a lot of different features. So there's variation. Some of that variation is actually determined by our genes. Some of it may be determined by the environments that we experienced as we developed, but some of it is determined by our genes. All right, so we begin with the notion that within populations there is variation. Uh, the second key element is that some of that variation in a particular environment provides an advantage. Just because you happen to be in an environment to which you are well adapted, and because of that you have a better chance of surviving and reproducing, and therefore of leaving more of your genes behind than those who are not as well adapted to that environment. So that's all it is. It's a very simple theory that provides an explanation for the pattern of biological diversity. It's also one of the best tested and best supported theories in modern science. So, um, Okay, so there, there are a couple of definitions. I use the word population. What is a population? Well, it's a group of individuals who potentially can interbreed living in the same space 
at the same period of time. And as I've mentioned, there are two conditions for natural selection to occur. One is that individuals vary and they, for a whole suite of characteristics and some of that variation is heritable, that in a particular environment, certain variations, certain versions of heritable traits help individuals survive better and reproduce better. If that's true, those traits are gonna be increased in the offspring of the individuals who have the desirable traits. Okay, so does selection actually work? Well, once again, we can just look at experiments and ask, can we achieve progressive change in a population over time? And here's an example from your, from your textbook of a famous set of experiments which were actually begun in 1895 at the University of Illinois and they're still going on at the present time. And what was done was to take a corn population and divide it up into a series of replicates. And one replicate was selected for increased protein content in the seed of the corn. Now this experiment began in 1895 and what was done is you, you you measure the protein content in the seed, you select a subset, let's say the highest 5% in protein content, and you use that subset for the next generation. And you repeat this process, generation after generation. Well, this gives you the results of that experiment, which is still ongoing, and it shows you that there's been a steady, almost linear increase in protein content in the seeds that act over 100 years, so from about 1895 to about 1995. In fact, the original population had about 11% protein in the seeds, and the final population has almost 30% protein in the seeds. So there's been almost a threefold increase in protein content over that 100 generations of selection. So clearly selection can be very effective. Now, if you look at this more closely, and you should, you might ask, well, yeah, this does look like it's fairly linear over time, but there's a few periods where there's a big jump. What happened? If you look um, oh, around generation 38 or so, there's a bigger deviations than we see in most of the generations. And again, around generation 92, there's a big deviation. Well, what accounts for that? Well, we don't know, but the likelihood is that there were some major genetic changes in the genome of corn. For example, the genes that encode for protein in the seed are storage protein genes. And these occur in multiple copies in the genome. And it is very likely that there were significant duplication events of genes which suddenly led to a bump up in the success of selection during those periods. So the process is not perfectly linear and repeatable, but it demonstrates the underlying point that selection can be very effective. So how do we answer other questions in biology? And your book has a couple of examples that I'll just quickly touch on. Um, one of them, is a, a simple question of why do giraffes have long necks, okay? Now there's, there's two competing hypotheses that your book explores. One of them is the food competition hypothesis. And the food competition hypothesis says that, well, the advantage of having a long neck is that you can eat from parts of the trees that nobody else can get to. And therefore you have a more assured source of food. So that seems very plausible. Why, why have such a bizarre feature? But it turns out that, that and, and that was just generally accepted as being the, the plausible explanation up until about a decade ago when some people began to observe gi giraffe behavior much more closely. And one of the things that they observed was that there's a, a very complicated um, mating ritual that goes on in, in giraffes. 
uh, males actually fight <laughs> over mates by hitting their heads against each other. And if you've got a longer neck, you've got a longer moment arm so that when you strike another male, you can hit them harder. And so the other competing hypothesis is, well, maybe it's not food competition, maybe it's sexual selection, maybe it's competition for mates, okay? So there are two competing hypotheses then. Now, you can't, it's not, not easy to, you know, do a lot of experiments with giraffes, they're pretty big and awkward and you've got to go to Africa to do it, and, but you can, you can go to Africa and observe them. And so this is the result of observations of giraffes in Africa. Most giraffes don't eat from trees that are really high. And if you plot the height of the source from which they're eating on the y-axis, this is actually a compound of the number of bites they take plus the height of the tree, so you have this curve. And then you put on this the average height of males. You see that most of the eating is taking place from vegetation, which is much shorter than the average height of a male giraffe. Okay, this is true for the female giraffes as well. So it doesn't look like there's, a, you know, that most of the consumption is taking place from the tops of the trees and that they need these long necks to do it. So this <coughs> tends to undermine the food competition hypothesis and makes the competition for mates hypothesis more plausible. So this is one kind of set of observations that we typically can do in biology to see if we can reject some explanation. And now, I don't think it's convincing that the food competition hypothesis has been completely rejected. I mean, it may be that there's small windows of the year when food competition becomes important. But certainly as a general explanation, it doesn't seem to cover the known observations. So at least it's possible that long necks are a result of maybe food competition occasionally, but maybe the bigger selective factor is competition for mates through this sort of strange fighting behavior which precedes the choice of a mate by males. Okay, here's another sort of very interesting and well-designed experiment um, with desert ants that once again illustrates how biologists go about asking questions. Um, so desert ants forage during the hottest part of the day. They live in the desert, it's very hot. They forage during the middle of the day when other predators are not out because of the heat. In fact, the temperatures can get up to 60 degrees centigrade, 140 or so Fahrenheit, very, very hot. But they forage for insect carcasses, where they, which is the major source of food energy, and they bring these back to their nests. And the question is, if they're going out foraging, how do they find their nests when they want to return? Because they, they forage in a, you know, in a kind of a random search pattern. After all, they're looking for, for dead insects to find. So they forage in sort of a random search pattern. And then when they decide to return to their nest with food, they walk straight back. And so how do they find their nests? Well. It, it's been shown that they actually sense direction from the position of the sun. So the two things, you've, they're living in a flat, two-dimensional world, okay? They gotta have two things. They've gotta have direction and they've gotta have distance. So they, they, they can determine direction from the position of the sun, but how do they determine distance? Well, some, Researchers got the idea that they determine distance by 
counting the number of steps from the nest. And they have to have some very sophisticated computational machinery built into their brains because they've got to adjust for the changes in direction to end up with a net correct distance back to the nest. But that's the hypothesis. So it predicts that the way they determine distance is by step counting, that they just count the number of steps. Okay? And you all know trigonometry, so and apparently ants do too, or <laughs> at least in this case. So you can adjust the number of steps taken in one direction using trigonometry and arrive at the straight line count. And somehow they do that and they count the steps back to the nest to find it. Now, how do we test a hypothesis like that? It's a pretty, pretty involved hypothesis. So it's called the pedometer hypothesis. You count steps, keep track of stride number. In all hypotheses, stride number has nothing to do with navigation. Well, if it's stride number, if, you, if, if it's the number of strides, what if you shortened the legs or made them longer? If they're longer, your steps are longer, and you're covering a greater distance with one step. If you shorten them, the steps are shorter, and you're covering a lesser distance. And that's exactly what these experimenters did. They, they took ants, and they divided them into three subsets of 25 each. One subset, they shortened the leg by snipping it off, uh, snipping some off to create a stump, okay, so they have shorter legs. One subset had normal legs, and one subset, they made them longer by adding a, a, a little stilt to it, okay? Now, they, They actually allowed the, the ants to go off foraging, and then they, they had a food bait at some distance out from their nest that they collected them from. They perfor performed this manipulation on the ants. Then they put them back and asked, what happens? Well, it, <laughs> it turns out that the results are pretty consistent with what you'd predict from the pedometer hypothesis, amazingly enough. The ants with the stumps stopped and started looking for the nest, which was 10 meters away, after a little more than five meters travel on average. The normal ants started looking for the nest at the right distance. And the ants with the stilts went about five meters too far before they looked for the ants, for the nest. Okay, so, so um, that's the display of the data is also important. You see the, the horizontal bar, that represents the total range of distances of all of the ants in each treatment. And then the colored segment, like the yellow block, represents the distance that 50% of the ants traveled in that treatment, okay? And then the line through it actually represents the modal distance. That's the distance that exactly half of the ants, the, the midpoint of the ants reached. So you see there's a lot of variation. Even, even though um, the data are pretty convincing, there's a lot of variation in the distance they traveled between the different treatments. Okay. Now you also want to <laughs> you want to do um, another experiment just to establish that your nothing about your manipulations has affected the result. And what they did in the other experiment was they took all, they took three groups and they 
they, they all, altered them all the same. So they all had stilts, and they showed that if they left with stilts, they returned to the right place. So this is a good experiment. It's well designed, and it establishes that this pedometer hypothesis is a plausible hypothesis. And this is the way in which biologists actually work. This is how they try and answer questions about biological phenomena. And it takes a lot of creativity to think up, first of all, the, the a good hypothesis, and then to design a convincing experiment to test it. Right now, there's, there's one other element of this chapter to talk about, and that is the tree of life. The tree of life depicts what we know about the relationships, the phylogenetic relationships among all the major classes of organisms on Earth. And this happens to be an area of very active research, um, particularly over the last decade. And the reason it's been a very active area of research over the last decade is the development of DNA sequencing technologies. There's been a huge uh, explosion in technological advances in DNA sequencing, which makes it possible to sequence genes or whole genomes very quickly now. And that means that we can take samples of all different categories of life, sequence a number of their genes, and then we can ask how distant in a mutational sense are different groups of organisms from one another. And the, the prediction should, is that organisms that are very different ought to have many more mutational differences than those which are very similar, because the very similar ones presumably diverge from a common ancestor more recently. So we use that data, and we'll come back and have a whole lecture on it, but we use that kind of data to reconstruct a depiction of the relationships among all life on Earth. And there's a, a man who, who really pioneered this, who's mentioned in your textbook, Carl Woos, who was um, at the University of Illinois for most of his career. He just died a little over a week ago. A remarkable man who began this field of constructing the tree of life by sequencing a particular molecule back in the days when it was very hard to do, um, back in the beginning in the late 60s and into the 70s, this molecule is one subunit of the ribosomal RNA. Now you know that the ribosomal RNA is responsible for protein synthesis, the assembly of protein synthesis in the cell. So it's a very fundamental molecule. Because it's so fundamental, all organisms have ribosomal RNA. So it's the perfect molecule to look at because it's universal, it evolves slowly, and he began this process by sequencing or inferring sequence differences in ribosomal RNA molecules a long time ago and created um, a whole field of research which has been quite remarkable. So this is a picture of the universal tree of life today, as, as we know it today. It's taken out of your textbook. And there are a couple of features I'd like to point to. One is that the assumption is that the, all life on Earth traces back to a single common ancestor, a single common origin. Now, why do we believe that? Well, we believe that because the hereditary molecule in all life is DNA or RNA. So there's a universal single hereditary molecule which supports the idea that there was a common origin for life. The three major domains of life, actually this term domains was one that Carl Woos suggested. There's the eukarya, these are eukaryotes, you all know eukaryotes, we're eukaryotes. The distinguishing feature about a eukaryote is that we have a 
of course, a cell, but then within the cell, uh, a nucleus, which is also enclosed within a mem membrane, and various cellular organelles. So there's the eukarya, and then at the top, there's the bacteria, the prokaryotes, which lack a nucleus. And in between the two is another domain called the archaea. The archaea lack a nucleus, but they have a number of other eukaryotic-like traits. And Carl Moos discovered the existence of this third major domain of life using his ribosomal RNA sequencing technologies. So today, a very active area of work is filling in all of the details about the universal tree of life. Now, where do we come from? Well, um, if you look at this, right out at the end are animals and fungi and, green plant, and land plants in the eukaryote. Very recent innovations in this history of life on Earth. I'll just end by saying one other thing, and that is how far back in time does this tree go? I told you that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. This common ancestor of life probably occurred or existed about 3.6 to 3.8 billion years ago. And to put that in scale, the occupation of the terrestrial environment only occurred about 500 million years ago. So this is a huge history in time. So we'll see you on Wednesday, and I'm sorry for the mix-up with the lectures. <laughs>